if you get off the bike and you're trying to pull your shoulders back to open up your posture, it's, it's not ideal because you're actually narrowing and putting tension into the system. And we into the, to be fluid, you mustn't have tension. You have to let it go. So I said to Tio, you can show your heart, which basically means if you sort of flare your chest and open your heart, your shoulders come back, but you get a three-dimensional shape in your chest and it opens. What it does do, though, it makes you very vulnerable because you're going to race with an open heart. And, you know, I told you that I, I said you can, that's one, that's something you can explore or that's what he did and it kind of worked for him, you know. And I think in, you know, in, in Kona, we talk about that crazy energy, you know, you've got to flow through you. Otherwise, all your, all your dysfunctions are amplified, I feel like, in Kona. And so, you know, Tio just managed to sort of open his heart and run in that state and, and it worked out and it was amazing. And then that's kind of probably why he mentioned me because it was, was quite emotional at that stage when he crossed the line. It was an amazing performance. But a lot of work beforehand, you know, it's, it's just popping the lid off a jar. <laughs> Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. I'm Jess, I'm your host, and I'm here with Coach BJ. We are the founders of Yogi Triathlete, and we are on a mission to create a better world. We're doing that by living off the front and against the grain. We are not your cookie cutter coaches, nor do we ever aspire to be. We work with our athletes as unique individuals and see each one as having limitless potential. We're here to wake up and shake up the world of endurance sports. I am super pumped for our guest today because he is in the business of change, one of our favorite things. And it's something that requires us to get out of our comfort zones and our patterned behaviors, the kind of change that allows for freedom in movement and mind. Lawrence Van Lingen. Hello. Did I pronounce, I pronounced yeah, yeah. that right? Hello, all right, he's here. Is the founder of Inner Runner, a space for people and athletes to come together to think, learn, and experience how to move better, feel better, and perform better in life, sport, and work. Lawrence is a well-respected, highly sought after soft tissue therapist and performance consultant. His inner tribe includes many well-known names of yesterday and today, including Rachel Joyce, Flora Duffy, Sam Wong, Tim and Rinnie, and YTP guests like Joe Gambles and Scotty D. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is your first podcast. Yes, it is. I'm a bit nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Go gently. <laughs> so why don't you start with telling us a little bit about yourself, like your background. I know you, you grew up in South Africa. And how did you get here to Laguna Beach and just the creation of, of Inner Runner? How I ended up in California is actually an interesting story. Um, I was a chiropractor in South Africa, and I ended up working... Um, in, in kind of high performance. I've been working for Red Bull as like as a high performance consultant for South Africa. And after my six month review, I, it went well, to say the least. They said, money is no object, build us a high performance center. And so I thought, well, that was quite good for a six month review. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was genuinely pleased with myself so I come home and I, I say to my wife you know that's extraordinary Red Bull wants me to like build and oversee and create this high performance center and kind of money's no object and she said well that's amazing but we're going to California <laughs> so, so was that part of the deal you were going to come to California to do it no just to be to, just to be set up in Cape Town in South Africa and so I was really booked. I was like booked three and a half months in advance in those days. And my wife talked to my receptionist and they just blotted out a, a week out of my calendar. And I mean, those poor people have to wait three and a half months before they get another appointment or like, you know, and I was like, I was so cross. You have no idea. And she flew me out to California and I was like a thundercloud on the plane and I was so unhappy. <laughs> and then I came here to Laguna Beach. And on the second day, I was like, I kind of like this place. <laughs> So and you so just did, felt it. Were you, were you coming here? Just, did she just book you for a vacation? Well, she works for Oakley. So she, she had an opportunity to work here for Oakley head office. And she said, no, we're moving to California. And, and so that was the thing. And I was like, no, I worked 20 years for like this high performance center. That was my dream. And she was like, no, but the dream's California. So that's how I ended up in California. I was like walking around Laguna Beach, kind of liked it. <laughs> and I thought like big fish, small pond or you know do you want to be in the big pond and i don't know i like the energy i like the place and it's just time for change and so here we are 
<laughs> Not a lot of people would say no to an opportunity like that, especially when the first sentence is money is no object. Yeah. I'm it, now looking back, it's I'm glad because I would have worked for well, they were pretty open, so they didn't want me to just work with Red Bull athletes. It wasn't that. The the, the kind of the vision was to do a high performance center but also to repair others and almost have a, I mean, at that stage, I'd, I could fly an athlete in for treatment, board them, and then send them off on, on, the, on Red Bull's tab. They were trying to, they don't do it here in the US as much, but uh, Red Bull was extraordinarily philanthropic and, and, and helpful in the community. So they were, like, they'd cut musicians. Um, if you were a, a band, they'd book studio time for you and have professionals come and cut in your first album. And so they were doing like a lot of philanthropic kind of work. And part of the vision was to like help injured athletes sort of get back and get on their feet and not just Red Bull athletes. So it, it, was, it had a great intention and great feel for it, but ultimately I would have been working for Red Bull. And, you know, it's, I think it's better that I, I'm now looking back, I'm so happy I came to California. I've just grown and it's been amazing. And I'm, I'm you know, I still have a good relationship with Red Bull, but I don't, you know, I'm glad I didn't work for them. So being in the business of change and this being a huge change, and I know when you got here, you were like, oh, Laguna's kind of cool, but now you got to set up shop. And so how did you adjust to that change? Badly. <laughs> so <laughs> change is hard. So I worked for, um, I got introduced to Kevin Rausch at Rausch PT, who kind of just really took me under his wing. And, and I worked there for, for six years and I'm always extremely grateful for Kevin and um, he looked after me just before I got in the plane when I, the plan was I was going to write my state and board chiropractic exams and, and practice as a chiropractor because that's what I was practicing at the time and just before I got in the plane they said oh while we recognize your international degree we don't recognize the college that you graduated from and he has a list of colleges that we do recognize and you need to graduate from one of them and obviously they're all Californian colleges so at that stage, I was where my headspace was going and how I was working. I, I looked at the curriculum. I looked at the the subject matter. I just I just knew I'm just not going back through that again. I'd love to have, I'd love to do like anatomy and go back and do the the basic sciences, but I just really didn't want to um, go back. And that wasn't where my head was. It wasn't how I was working. I, you know, I come if you go back, if you circle a little bit back, you know, how did I get here? I I used to do a lot of rehab. And then I was did fitness and conditioning and rehab for for teams for rugby teams. So I was a fitness and conditioning coach for four years with a rugby team. And so I was really into movement, into rehab, into fitness, into conditioning. We used to do dry needling. I started working with fascia at that stage. I was really intrigued by fascia. So like you know, I just didn't want to go back and rehash rehash my degree. I wanted to do something else. I used the time and the. And then also, I was kind of burnt out. I'd been working really, really hard, like crazy hard and high stress. We had this like just pressure cooker environment. And, and an interesting thing is people used to come to me and, and put their problems on my table. And it was like, you got to fix me because no one else can. Or, you know, I, I don't want to have surgery now. It's, so all that burden was placed on me. I mean, I, I treat very differently now when I work with people in a very different communication. So it's, it's not my problem, it's your problem. I can help you solve it. And, and I, so at that stage, I was trying to, I knew I had to change and had to think differently. And so I spent an extraordinarily large amount of time kind of thinking about new ways to, to and soft and gentle ways to basically treat people and, and build up a new system of treating. I started doing some YouTube videos back in the day, which was more or less just to help like I had an athlete in mind for every I used to do unlisted YouTube videos for an athlete so I'd say like let's say hey Rachel okay I want you to do this this will help and then I said well, I might as well make that generic so then I just made a YouTube video and then just put them online for everyone um, but at that stage I was you know clearly starting to think I need to change and I need to change the way I treat and how I'm going to change so I've, I've been on that that's what happened in California is I re rethought everything well, it's interesting how the um, series of life situations and life events will really, if you are meant to change and you're meant to, you know, grow out of the box, like it will happen. Life will 
life will roll that out for you. And you can kick and scream a little bit along the way, as much as you want, in fact. But eventually, you know, that, that higher intelligence is going to win out. And it got you to start thinking differently, which I'm sure has translated into how you work with your clients and helping them to think differently. Because when we're talking about change and people coming to you, they're coming to you because of a pattern that's been developed. So how have you seen that translate, um, like you're having to now think out of the box and translating that to your clients in supporting them in change? An interesting thing is if you want to help people, you have to have kind of gone through it yourself or you have to have a lot of experience. Those are, those, those are the two. You, you don't have to have lived an extraordinary life to do extraordinary work, but then you're going to need a lot of experience. An interesting story happened in, in this whole process of kind of re, reworking and reshaping the way I treat is when I was in Europe working with uh, the downhill mountain bike team that I work with, Santa Cruz, I fell and my arm broke and it broke really easily. And I was like, oh, that's not good. I was just trying to catch a fall in my arm. I could feel it just break. I was like, oh, no, that's not good. So we go to the hospital and this very stern German doctor says, so, how is your health? I was like, oh, that's not a good question. <laughs> you know, any blood in the stools? <laughs> you coughing up the blood? <laughs> I was like, where are you going with this? Show me my x-ray. <laughs> so it turned out I had a tumor in my forearm, right? And anyway, <laughs> then, then I went through a real rough patch of about, um, it took about 50 days, I think, before I finally had surgery in my arm where we didn't know what it was. And so luckily... Um, I got sent to like a very, very gifted surgeon up in uh, Cedar sinai and, and he was the first person talking, starting to talk sense because the differentials were you've got like lymphoma or, or myeloma or it's a secondary from cancer somewhere else. So that, that, was, that was a rough period and basically I spent that time just walking up and down. The, I'd walked every day on the beach and it was extraordinary. So every time I think about, well, I might lose my arm, I might have to go through. My mom died of cancer. I've had cancer before. This was like, it was not a great time. So when I was walking on the beach, I, I, I decided to reimagine movement from the ground up. So every day I set myself a task. The first day, I'm going to think about what the foot does when we walk. And then I'd go and walk on the beach. Then I'd come back. Then I'd look at the anatomy books because I wasn't working. And that was like really the catalyst for change. But it's interesting, it's like, do you really have to go through that to change? <laughs> you know, because change was that like kind of forced. But at least I saw, I turned it into a positive. Like I, I took those, I mean, I could have walked up and down and got down to myself into a dark place. And I, I chose to, every time I felt bad or I, like, you know, the monkey mind or whatever, how do you quiet the monkey mind? You give it a banana. The banana was, everything from the toe up to the head what's its purpose in walking what's its purpose in running what's its purpose in life and i re kind of re i restudied the whole body in terms of that context while i walked and i can imagine that that increased a gratitude that you have for the body yeah and also extreme like acute awareness of the body yeah and how the mind right how the mind relates to the body how so when you're you're listening to or you're feeling your feet in the sand, you're also thinking like, okay, well, what's, what's happening up here, right? Because something has to move that foot yeah. forward. So where is that connection? So is the, is the jet jump start like where, like where you could take this possibly? Yeah, so that, that was kind of like a, a definite start in, in, in a run of workshops and, and how I wanted to start changing the way so in a runner workshops are born out of like, we have this innate ability, it's genetic. You know, it's got this millennia behind us, this weight. You know, why do we have to overthink it? I, I look at how everything's going on at the moment, you know, and it's like playing whack-a-mole. Oh, my arm's out, we'll whack it back down. You know, and it's, no, it's, you have a lateral instability, that's why your arm's up, it's for balance. <laughs> you know, fix your lateral instability and the arm drops down. You know, so everything's so reactionary in, in terms of running and cueing and, and so I was trying to think of like more come back to the center and the source and, and where does this all come from, you know, and, and you're quite right. But ultimately, you've, you, you're at a place where you mustn't think about it. You have to let go. You have to not even think. Right. No thought. Yeah. No thought. And in that example you just gave, the person with the arm over the hand, and we experience this too, is that person will go online and they'll like bury themselves in it could possibly be this. And... 
I can't, I'm not supposed to do this. And it's going to take 10 weeks sometimes for people. And then they start talking to their friends and then their friends give their perspective. And then this thing blows up into like, I'll never be able to lift my arm over my head again. That's how it explodes. Yeah, Dr. Google getting, getting consults. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that's, that's the work. The work is actually, the work is, you know, doing the things to get the arm moving, but it's also like, let's, let's reframe this in your mind in a way that you understand that this isn't the end of the world. This is an opportunity, the same thing that happened to you. Like, you can't work. You couldn't work for 50 days. You couldn't physically work. So what do you do with your time? Do you sit on the couch and and bury yourself and just, you know, in misery? Or do you do something about it? And maybe there were moments there where you maybe you can speak to that if you felt like down, like, am I ever going to be able to use this arm? But instead, you just you just kept digging deeper and getting curious about what this will teach you. Yeah, yeah. It was 50 days before I had surgery and they came, they came up with the diagnosis of we don't know what it is, but it's most likely benign and we've never seen it before. <laughs> then I had gratitude because, <laughs> and, but then, then I had to have a bone graft. So it was, a, it was the, the, walking, the, the walking continued afterwards just to, to stretch out that timeline. But yeah, it was pretty dark at some stage, you know. It's that doubt and uncertainty is terrible and having a purpose is, is, is what you've got to replace it with, you know. Yeah, so is that how, is that, what sort of pulled you out of those moments, knowing that you were going to find a connection to then bring this to other athletes? Yeah, yeah. I, I was a little bit more self-centered. I, I got to say, I was, I was a little bit more worried about myself than other athletes at that time. But yes, I, tr I, I thought part of it was like, I just realized if I, if I lose my arm and I only got one hand, there's a lot of things that I do that I'm going to have to change. I'm like, there was a lot of two hand operating and I thought, okay, you better, you better learn how to consult and you better. So the, the part of the creating the workshops was if I could never treat people again, like I did, I think I would have found a way, you know, I don't ever want to be tested on that, but. So yes, it was dark. It was mucky, but you were already in what we would call like solution energy. Yeah. You were already like, okay, so if I, if this, if this arm is not going to be there anymore, what can I do? which I think um, is, a really, is a really great phrase for athletes who are, we would call it opportunity, we always call it like injury, or, or as one of our athletes quoted us the other day, things that suck, we say, is an opportunity, right? Because it's always an opportunity to grow, to heal, to get more balanced, to get stronger, to you know, reach your potential. I always see it as an opportunity. And you know, we have to go through that contrast. We, we have to go through that contrast. When, if you, when you look back now, do you look back at that experience as a gift? Yeah, for sure. And every, in every two, to, you know, to further on from what you said, in every negative experience, there's a gift and a lesson. And, you know, you just have to learn the gift and the lesson. And, and so much of, I used to say, I work really well with elites and desperate. And I, I kind of thought the elites was because they had such good sense of their body and such good body awareness. And the desperate because they're just forced to change. They've, they've tried everything. Now they're ready to change. And then later on, I realized it's, it's, the elites are elite because they're so good at over, under, and through obstacles. Yes. So one's forced to change. The other rose to the top because they're so good at dealing with, with change. Or yeah. And yeah. they have the discipline. That's what I find too, um, working with athletes. I find that the, the, the more elite, the more disciplined, the more they're, they're just like a sponge. They're, they're used to absorbing information and putting it into action. And then, yeah, the desperate. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like, does it have to get that bad? <laughs> I wrote, a, I wrote a, a, a blog post called Rock, Bot Rock Bottom is a great place to start. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about, um, you know, what is your observation of that anatomy of change? I think change is, change is the hardest thing. And there is, there is, what we can say about change is change is hard, but not changing is harder still. So either you're going to change because you want to, and you can change a little bit every day proactively, or change will be thrust on you, and that's not going to be that pretty. Um, if you look at someone's posture or let's say we have a tight muscle, like what is a tight muscle? 
a tight muscle is a reflection of a habit. You know, you're using it habitually in a certain way and therefore it becomes tight. It's not, it's not, it's not something to be theragunned. I mean, you can theragun it if you want to, but you, you have to change a movement pattern, so you have to change a habit. And the habit, habits are extraordinarily powerful. So you know, often I have a client and I'll ask them who, if they're stuck and they don't want to change. So how did you get here? Oh, I drove. Yeah, do you remember driving here? No. How did you drive here? Autopilot. Oh, do you remember when the first time you drove? Yeah. You would have probably broken out in a sweat to try and get here. And you would have concentrated every millimeter of the way. You know, and so we can do extraordinarily complex things just out of pure habit, and and it's to change that habit. So no one's changing any stuck pattern without changing a habit. A habit is a, from a tight muscle to a reflex response to anything. It's changed, and it's a habit you're changing, and that's that's ultimately what it is. What's at the root of changing a habit? What is like the number one thing you think somebody it's required? to start changing a habit? I think you have to want to, want to. There's got to be a will. Um, and then, yeah, that is the rub. And, it, and it's, ultimately, I think it's breathing. And you'll hear many, many really good therapists. And you, I've heard it so many times in my, in my sort of career, like first work with breath. And, and I used to do that. I, by, by the time I left South Africa, I was your first consultation no matter what, we, we assess breathing, we start talking about breathing, we introduce that as a theme. Um, and then I kind of got away from it a little in the US, people were like, what, breathing, are you mad? You know, like my elbow. <laughs> and so <laughs> now, you know, now I work a little different. Um, any stuck client that I've had over the years, when you get to a point where like you've tried everything, then then you go to breathing and it's extraordinary. Breathing is like a rabbit hole if you, you just go down the rabbit hole with breathing with a client and it's extraordinary what comes up. So I think that's the, for most people, you know, I say you take 20,000 breaths a day. If you change your pattern of breathing, you're going to take 20,000 different breaths and those 20,000 different breaths represent 20,000 different choices. It's a different pattern. What do you see mostly when you start working with breath with a client who perhaps may not have really noticed their breath all day, let alone the last six months or years? Always like a stuck pattern or restriction. Triathletes generally have good breathing because of swimming. So swimming is really good for your breathing. And so you, you kind of have a healthy diaphragm. If you, if you just a quick, a quick sort of zoom out, look at someone's breath, you want to look at the top of their shoulders or your thoracic outlet and see how tense that is or not tense. And then you want to have a look at the diaphragm and those two talk to each other. You know, once you start getting a little bit deeper and the exciting part, because everyone wants to know, well, this is amazing, but how do I go faster? <laughs> is, is what I call the, what's called the spinal engine, which is your psoas muscle and diaphragm and using those two to generate power. And then that's cool because that's huge um, increases in, in performance if that gets healthy and switches online. But very few Western people have a spinal engine and use it and incorporate it in their, in their movement. So how do you start getting that thing online? That's what everybody wants to know. <laughs> Watch my YouTube videos. <laughs> oh my God, well, we've been binging. We've been binging. a lot of likes and a lot of uh, views over the past yeah, two days. Yeah, I started my day with penguins, <laughs> by the way. Oh, lovely. With the amazing, the amazing. Oh, the awesomizer. Awesomizer. Yeah, I did the awesomizer yeah. today as well. <laughs> yeah, awesomizer is cool. Um, what do you think are um, like is a misconception about breath and, and performance? How it relates to performance? Breath's a big deal now because it's coming it's coming into our consciousness collectively and in, in the sporting community. So there's breathing masks, there's there's altitude, which is you know all of this affects sort of breath. Um, there's you know Wim Hof is doing a lot of breath work, so there's a lot of breath work. I got a joke for you. How do you know if someone's working on their breathing? they'll tell you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when i did that i like i, I tensed up my rib cage um so i was watching i don't watch I, i'm terrible I'm, I'm i must confess i don't i don't kind of have the time of the headspace to listen to a lot of podcasts or or, or or listen to a lot of other people i just don't have time so but I, I i was watching a guy talking about breathing and breath control and how important it is and 
And while the guy was talking, his breath was so restricted. So just like he was gasping and he's like, Ugh! and then grunting. And, his, you know, he had such a big breath restriction. And I'm like, dude, listen to yourself. So, so really easy. One of the easiest ways to think about breath is what does it sound like? Can you talk and, and keep talking and there's no, you know, it's not staccato, it's not restricted. And also the timber in the pitch, if your breathing system works, it resonates better. So people have a more relaxed diaphragm. You know, I can tighten up my diaphragm and change the pitch of my voice. I can tighten up my shoulders and change it even more. I can tighten up my pelvic floor. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's along those lines. So, so that is interesting. I think you as an athlete, if you're competing, if you, if you gasp when you run, if you hold your breath when you swim, you know, those are patterns that you want to you want to free up. It's really important not to sort of go, <gasps> you know, and a lot of people do that when they swim. They grunt and they, they hold their breath underwater and that, you know, you don't breathe out fully and you don't have free exhaling. So work, you know, just that's really, really important. What we came upon when we, um, we had Jerry Rodriguez on the podcast and I experienced this too in my coaching and actually I was given this advice too was, you know, the longer you hold your breath, you know, if you swim four strokes, six strokes, eight strokes on one breath, it's better because you're, you're getting longer and you're, and you're feeling that. And the new athletes I get, that's what they're coming from. And, and Jerry equated it to, you need fuel for the body. You need that oxygen. It's fuel. Um, when I made that transition and as I transition other athletes, they begin to make that connection. Like, oh, this is, this makes sense. Like I need air to breathe. I've got to pick up my head more, which creates more problems because of their body alignment and, and all that stuff with swimming. But I want to know what your take was. Do you, cause you were a triathlete too. Is that just pool swimming? Like why do people feel so compelled to hold, hold the breath versus take more? In, in swimming, the most important thing, or the, f the first place you want to start, I was a lifeguard for 10 years in a very busy beach, so I've, I've pulled quite a few people out the water. And most people, you cannot learn to swim and if you have a fear of drowning. And so most people need to learn how to relax and let go in the water and just have no tension. So that's a huge thing. And I don't know if you've ever experienced like how, how people will freak out when they lose their goggles. So a, a cool exploration to do is to, to put a um, diving goggles, like a, a snorkel and mask on, and then put your face under the water and then notice your breath when you first start doing that and see if it's tight and see if it's restricted. And then once you're breathing and it's nice and relaxed and there's no tension in your, in your lungs, okay, take the mask off and let the water hit your eyes and open your eyes and see if you can still breathe. And most people can't breathe. So we have a, you can't, you go, <coughs> it's very, very difficult to breathe if there's, water in contact with your eyeballs even though you have a snorkel and i think that's a real good indicator when you this whole breathing analogy on on is like a drowning person no one listens to a drowning person and no one cares what a drowning person thinks and the drowning person is clearly not thinking clearly they'll stand on their own children's head to get another breath of air so that's breathing restriction absolutely personified and amplified Whereas if you, the lifesaver, they're competent and relaxed, they can be in a surreal moment of calm. You can, you know, I've had these sort of moments where time slows down and you can swell the, smell the sunscreen on the water and you're aware of the waves and the rhythm and the current and the tide. You, you're immersed in an extraordinary aware process and you see, you know, you know you're, you're just being and I don't know, like this whole surreal experience of utterly in control and utterly aware and processing huge amounts of information and time slows down and you save this person they're having the exact opposite experience they're in tunnel vision their whole body's tight it's like rictus they, they don't even float because they hold so much tension in their body they're just going to drop like a stone and they, you know so so breathing is, is if you think of that continuum you say like well where am i on the continuum of amazing breathing or restricted breathing or scared of water and, and fear and because fear is tension tension is getting tighter and tighter and we you just got to let it go and relax and be fluid we're 72 percent water hopefully as you sit here right so obviously our movement must be fluid if you want to swim fast you have to be fluid you have to match the water how did you form that relationship with the water was it simply just breathing or your mindset experience yeah, well, I was a good swimmer and I, I came from a swimming background and then you trained and you're competent and I suppose you've done it a few times. But I, I think a lot of people experience in, if you're trained in, in a critical situation, time slows. I mean, that's, 
you know, at Red Bull, they, they hooking people up to electrodes on their brain and kind of trying to train it into people. But we've all got that. You know, everyone's had that moment where time slows and you're aware of everything and you're in control. Do you have a, like a mindfulness practice or a meditation practice that you do? Yeah, I do. I have to. What does it look like? This is an area where, like full disclosure, I think people that start to work more than just superficially on their breathing. So like Wim Hof breathing or accelerate or enhanced breathing or, I don't know, dragon breath or anything um, that where you go after breathing, you really get involved in breathing. Or mindfulness. I think people need to, ha- you need to have a disclaimer and say that this can really change your life and do you understand what you're setting yourself in for? So let's just have, let's just get the disclaimer out of the way. <laughs> I, th- I feel dentists were really smart because they kind of got us brushing our teeth two minutes twice a day and everyone does it. There's very few other health practitioners that have got that right. <laughs> okay. Like I never think about my GP until I have a problem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so, so I think a little bit of mobility every day, and I've tried to create that like real simple, effective mobility routines, like five minutes every day is really, really powerful and gentle and it's enough. And I think with mindfulness and meditation, it's the same. You want to do a little bit and do a little bit every day and just see how that rolls. Otherwise, there becomes almost this burden of expectation. Right. Like, I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, so this is what I teach. I teach meditation and, and, and mindfulness to athletes. And, and sometimes I get like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can do like 30 minutes every day. Maybe I'll do a second meditation. I'm like, whoa, pump the brakes. Like, let's just get consistent. I don't care if it's two minutes. I don't care if it's one breath. I don't care if it's an hour. Just do it every day. Yeah, like, that's, let's get that's consistent. It. Yeah, and a small bit consistent until you notice the change, until you notice that you know, if you don't do it for three days, what does that feel like? And then it becomes real to you. Like, that's, that's a huge part. You were talking only about change. Nothing I do on, like, we're sitting around my table, my treatment table, right? Nothing I do on the table matters unless the, the client can experience the change and can then do something with that change. You, I, you, it happens. You can treat someone and have an extraordinary session and they get up, they don't realize what happened, they weren't in their body, they had an agenda, their agenda wasn't met and they'll walk out and it's as though you didn't touch them. And someone else knows exactly, you know, it can be life changing or it can be like, that didn't happen. How do you let go of, of that when you just see the, you're just like, they're just not getting it. How do you let go of that and you're just like, or do you? okay, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> I'm kind of at the stage where no one really walks through my door unless they want change. (laughs) So I'm I'm kind of free of that now. Yeah, isn't that great? Like they're coming to you because of what you offer. Yeah, I've got this cyclist and he's referred like, I don't know, 20 cyclists to me. Not one of them come to see me and I said, dude, they don't want to change. They know at the other end of that conversation is change and they don't want to change and that's fine. I was just talking to BJ in the hallway and we were... um, we were looking at something that one of our athletes had posted and I said, my God, like these athletes are amazing. I can't believe what they're doing. And I said, do you think some people look and they say, my God, I could never change. Like they, they make people do crazy shit. Like they make people do like crazy shit. And we don't make anybody do anything, but we just ask them to pay attention. Pay attention while you're training. Pay attention while you're brushing your teeth. Pay attention while you're in traffic. Just start paying attention. And when you pay attention, you start to see how you're moving through the world. Right. So you you get to see if your breath is restricted or if it's relaxed or, you know, if you're happy, if you're not happy, if you're pretending to be happy, whatever it may be. But um, presence, like where does where does like what is if you were to articulate what presence is, what would that look like? I, I, I relate it back to calm. I think the calmer you are the more space you have and the more in the moment you are. And so calming down allows you, and you ask me, am I mindful and do I meditate? I have to, because I have to hold that space for my clients. It, it, it reflects in my work almost immediately. And if I don't meditate and, and do mobility work and mobility work and posture work, if I don't do that in the morning, I notice it that day when I treat. If I don't do it two mornings, I think, clients maybe pick up about three mornings of no mobility and meditation in the morning and you know I'll have people you know clients ask me are you okay and what's going on and you know it's it's that staggering so like I kind of have to what is it that you feel when you don't do those things 
Well, an interesting thing, hap I'm, I'm all about, I think most of us are, the, the world at the moment is, it's so fragmented. People are so pulled apart. And we can talk about like sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And I think most people are, especially here in, in, in kind of California, although it's pretty laid back and people are into their bodies and it's, it's really cool. I think people are just, most people are way, way, way too fragmented or sympathetic and they're not grounded. And I, I experienced like proper grounding first time walking actually. I like reset my nervous system while I was walking. And it was the most extraordinary thing. I just, my, I knew what to do. I rationalized, I need to, when I walk, I, I need to relax and not lift my heels off the ground that quickly. But it didn't help just putting them down hard. And I kind of let go and my nervous system down regulated and the muscle tension is my body changed and then my Achilles reflex or whatever let go and therefore I extended my walk and then that just pulled me down. I just be walked and was grounded and I was like, oh my word, this is extraordinary. So there's like kind of life changing, one surreal moment. And I thought, I'm not going into work today. I'm just going to walk in this track until I drop. This was the first time this, I mean, this just happened the other day. That was the first time and I've been kind of seeking it my whole life. That's, you know, that's 45 years of work went into, I was like, wow, I'm grounded and present and in the moment, for real. No shit, right? <laughs> it can take a long time. So that, that's, pa right? So patience, where does patience come in in the anatomy of change? Where do you, how important is patience? Yeah, you got to stick at it. And I, like, well, to circle back, so I think just working in it a little bit patiently and persistently, you know, we're, we're hunter-gatherers. Um, and so we had to be patient and we had to be persistent and that's how we we got where we are and I, you know i really think that's it's important and it's it's not you know we you don't want to chase stuff too much you know like i want this amazing experience as well it's like no you kind of want to just trend in the right direction and the breakthroughs come if, when you start seeking it you can often not find what you're seeking for so i think you know that's a big deal but for to, to now, I think you can calm and ground people. I, I'm doing an amazing structural integration course and you're just seeing people just get, the, you know, that kind of work really grounds people really quickly. You know, so I, th I think there are easier ways than my way. <laughs> <laughs> what about attachment? So attachment to how this exercise is going to um, help me or attachment to, I'm gonna go see Lawrence and then I'll probably be up at the top of the podium and the attachment these athletes have to to a is plus b is going to equal c do you see that a lot yeah yeah um my website is a slow work in progress but basically I, i'm i'm trying to create a cultural safe place for people to think so that you can change your world view because that's like attachment everyone's doing it this way so everyone sees it this way so it must be right I mean, we were talking, Jan Fredina was talking about how when he didn't race in Kona, but he went there, he noticed the energy and how wound up everyone was. And he's like, oh, that was me too. And so he, he says, I can't come back here like that. And he recognized what, what had kind of gone wrong the year before when he, you know, his back had gone out and he realized like how wound up he was and how much, how uptight he was. But you have to be able to get out of it to see it. So when he went back and he wasn't competing, he was like, these people are all nuts. <laughs> and he said, oh, I was like that too. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's hard. It's, it's really hard to change your worldview. And, you know, like we talk about calm. I like calm is amazing. If you can calm your mind down, you access basically your subconscious, your superconscious. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're an ancient Greek and you believe in the muses or if, or if you believe in angelic beings or, you know, Isaac Newton was dozing in an apple tree, in an apple orchid. And, Orchard, and he said, God put that knowledge inside my head. I did not think of um, basically the laws of physics myself. God put that knowledge in my head. And that's what it is. If you calm down, you kind of have access to the insights. And But like the drowning person is not calm and they're going to have no insights. Or they might like have a massive rush in adrenaline and have some insight. But, you know, we don't, that's not kind of how we want to look for change. Yeah. They, <laughs> The calm is just so, I'm glad that you, you really focused on that because it's really the area where we begin to 
disseminate that the the noise that continually is coming in and we begin to to realize there is this noise and then we begin to realize oh well i can choose to listen to that noise and then you realize there's two people in there there's the noise and then you're watching it right the calm allows for the space to be wider and it allows us to make a decision moving forward as athletes what are the things that that athletes can do to pull themselves apart to see what's happening so like Jan Fredino he got injured that's how he was like okay well these guys are wacko how can we do that before we get injured I guess mindfulness and meditation is is a way but also I want you to talk about body awareness yeah mindfulness and meditation that you know if you're racing Kona next year start now <laughs> you know do a little bit of meditation every day a little bit and, every day over and, a long period and a little of bit of mobility and until it becomes real for you you know none of this this conversation doesn't matter unless you can extract something out of it for yourself and you know talking about the same thing again and again from different ways should resonate with someone and then you, and then you know so if i I don't want to talk too much about me, but again, in the, in the running workshops, I'll say, I'm going to explain this to an artist. I'm going to explain it to an engineer. I'm going to explain it from so many different ways that you're going to get it. But we're all very, very different. So when I'm explaining to the engineer, artist, just, you know, like figure it out. You know what I mean? Don't just bear with me. We're coming to, to visual people, to auditory people, to feeling, to kinesthetic people. So people are so different. So you, we just got to make it real for you and you've got to start somewhere and it's got to be like your vibe. You know, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I've been asked many times, I have a basic mobility routine on YouTube and many people said, I want the intermediate one and there's an ultimate mobility routine. <laughs> there's no intermediate one. And, and the reason is because you're kind of supposed to grow your own intermediate one. <laughs> like, you know, at that stage, you're supposed to like, you know, find your wings and start to fly. So I think you know how you recognize in your body you, you might hold tension or you, your resting heart rate might be elevated in the morning or you might be snappy or you might there's so many different ways like i don't know just just everyone's so different and i find it extraordinary you'll we'll, we'll have someone that's like let's say 55 years old and doesn't know that let's say eating chicken doesn't agree with them like where you been for 55 years you know the point with age is supposed to come wisdom you're supposed to figure out like that does not agree with me <laughs> or that does agree with me and you know and that's it we've got to kind of find out who your spirit animal is your, your spirit totem yeah, it's and, bringing that awareness it's yeah, such yeah. it's it's that numbing out right so i i've done it too or I, finally i've taken ownership of some things that have been you know keeping me not where i want to be and it takes time and and if you have that um, that calmness and patience, then you you'll see. And what what clicked with me this morning, I think I was watching it was the penguin, right? Just a simple, basic move that you put up on a YouTube video, and it's super simple. And you even said to it like, "Just do five reps each side, and just do that for a couple of weeks. Don't try and accelerate it and do it six times a day, and just." get that simple movement down and and speaking to what you just what you just shared is that resonated with me like because i have that open mind of like okay these minor minor movements if you can't even do that how are you going to go run a you know a six minute mile that you want to run right the two just aren't connecting one is physically in your awareness because you saw it on Instagram or you saw, or that's the time that you want when the real work is done deep down. So I think, I think everyone should definitely check out your YouTube videos. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know Talbot, you had some advice from Talbot that you shared on there. We had Talbot on the podcast and he's just a hustler. He's like, get, get that stuff up there. Like, don't worry, fidgeting around with it, getting it clean and proper. Get it yeah, up there. He's amazing. Yeah. I, I can summarize that a little bit. I, I kind of worked with an athlete today and I said, if, if it doesn't, the evolutionary biologists say nothing makes sense except shed in the light of evolution. That's Theodosis, I can't pronounce his second name, Dotskiewski, whatever. So, so that's how they, if it doesn't make sense in terms of evolution, they're not entertaining it. For the triathlete out there in this like over communicated world and everyone's an expert and everyone's kind of doing stuff. Like, you need to think in terms of my movement. Is my movement fluid and is it rhythmical? If there's not rhythm and fluidity in my movement, it's a mistake. 
We've got to let it go and let it go and find and, and anything. It's it's okay to do. We we're talking how this conversation came up. You were talking about like working with a metronome. A metronome is 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 staccato. It's ta 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 ta. ta. That's the, that creates tension. That's why like marching bands before war. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it creates tension, so we can go to battle. <laughs> okay. Whereas running is rhythm, you're breathing in and you're breathing out and you're taking three steps and each step is different. So you've got these overlaying rhythms, you've got this forward and back and breathing in and you've got this releasing and breathing out. So you're going ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
I'm from Africa. <laughs> the lion eats the weak. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> I think you've got to, you to kind of know yourself and then you can relax and be vulnerable when, and open. You know, it takes strength and courage to be vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. And I think relaxation and being calm and vulnerability go hand in hand. And I just, I love that that went on the world stage. So I know that there was a village uh, behind him in a lot of years of his own work and discipline, but that was just, that was amazing to hear. I loved that. Let's talk a little bit about, so just some movement. Uh, we had reached out to Scotty about, you know, like what, what he's learned from you. And of course there's 8 million things that he's learned from you. Uh, but what did he say, Beach? Uh, what did Scotty say? He's made me realize over the years how having happy hips is like finding the foundation of youth. Yeah, Scotty and Carrie are just amazing humans, which is, it's nice to work with amazing humans. Um, they, yeah, just, it, it's incredible. Scotty's changed slowly, but he's just, again, it's that persistence and he just doesn't give up and he's really nuggety and he just, you know, he's just stuck at it and, and so is Carrie. And their formula is simple. I mean, I think, they basically do penguins and happy hips every day. It's not that complicated. You know, there's not a complicated formula to, to freeing up his body and opening it up. And yeah, yeah he's had some sessions where they, they come in one on one where you have body mm -hmm. work, but their maintenance and, you know, all of these athletes like Tio, his, from the work that we need to do from him, it's extraordinarily simple. It is the basics. It doesn't have to be complicated. Again, overthinking it. If there's one thing I learned from, from riding with those guys is it's pretty much just do the work day in and day out and show up. And K you've been working with Carrie too? Yeah, a little bit. I, um, I helped her quite a long time ago. She had, um, when, the, when Scotty and Carrie first came to see me and then, you, you know, she takes ownership. It's just crazy. So she, she do, almost doesn't like getting treated, but she just does, she does do the work. Yeah. You know, and then that's fun. Because it's not about, it's not really about me. If I treat you and I do something and they're like, wow, that's really cool. And you get up and, oh, Lawrence is amazing. And, you know, it does happen. That's, that's amazing. But then you, you don't own that process. It's far more important that the person gets up and then does the work and then figures it out for themselves and then takes ownership of it. And an interesting thing is like, just back to TO, you know, success and failure are two sides of the same coin and we shouldn't take either too seriously. So Tio needs to get over his exceptional race very, very quickly. And on the other side, I treated Rini just before the race, and I told her she was good to go, and she wasn't. So if, I'm, if my name has got to be attached to Tio, then my name should also be attached to Rini, who didn't complete the race. And both of them need to get over that race real quick and get on with, you know, every day the artist needs to wake up and create a new, <laughs> just, you know. I love that. I love that. And I'm such a firm believer of that too. It's like, okay, it's in the past, move on. Cause right now is the, is the precious gift. Like, how are you going to move forward? How are you absorbing, right? Like they're going to absorb fitness from that day and, um, leave it behind for, because for every high, there's a low, we live in a world of contrast. So I know you had a question from one of your community members on Achilles tendinosis. What was that question? Do you want to address it? He's battling with Achilles, and it's a long, complicated answer. I, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm just going to, I reached out and I wrote him an email and explained it to him, so we kind of don't have to go through it. An interesting thing that I see very, very often is tension in your extremities, so in your hands or in your feet, like your plantar fascia, your Achilles in your hand is very, very often linked to diaphragm tension. I had a client in here today, and she's been battling with bilateral Achilles pain, getting out of bed and severe, I mean, she hobbles, she can't, she can't kind of make the bathroom, it doesn't work, work, you know, felt really, really trapped, and it's every time after she lies down. Relieved her dia rele released her diaphragm, she got off the table pain-free for the first time in five years, in, in the table, and every morning since. It's, so, you know, the, the, I can tell you now that if you have a foot injury, or if you have a hand injury, or if you have Achilles injuries, like the, you definitely want to work on your breathing, and that diaphragm tension, when, when, again, going back to lifeguarding, when people drown or are drowning or become oxygen starved, their hands start to curl and shorten and they'll start to internalize. You get a flexion withdrawal response. It's kind of one of the things that the penguin does is it down regulates your flexion withdrawal response. 
And so like a breath crisis, you'll have tension in your extremities and it's in a flexion withdrawal pattern. So you find that your foot starts to twist. So if you've, if you've got a shortened leg that kind of feels twisted, it's a breathing problem. Sort the breathing out. Same with your hand. Okay, so breathing's really foundational. Foundational. And, you know, the penguin is also, it's pretty vulnerable too. I mean, you're just, you're supine and you're kind of lifting the hips and the heart's open and the arms are spread. So, um, yeah, people need to check that out. So speaking of, how do people get... How do people follow you? And do you have workshops? Do you have any events coming up that people can be a part of? I'm fleshing out the, the running workshops. I've, I've kind of evolved them. At four, people used to come to my workshop and be like, wow, that's amazing, now what? And then I didn't have a now what? So I'm trying to build a back-end library so that you'll go to the workshop and then feel supported afterwards. So the running workshops will start kicking off soon. Um, just got some, I've got quite a lot on my plate. So as soon as we get that up and running, then I'll do that if you can the website is www.innerrunner with one r and on there you can i kind of put up blogs every now and again or the youtube videos are listed through then obviously social media like instagram or so but the website would be the home because everything can sort of flow out from there and you had mentioned um you know we we're talking uh yesterday uh just texting about um a sweat test event you're going to be having with precision precision hydration what's going on with that yeah i'm really excited about that uh my friend andy blow has a a company called precision hydration precision hydration i know i couldn't they- say that one either <laughs> it must be something in my diaphragm exactly on the throat <laughs> Or in the, uh, no, no. Um, just open, so your, they just do, open your heart, Lauren. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I feel better already. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone has a genetic um, sweat rate. So how much water you lose. And also everyone has a genetic, how much electrolytes you lose in that sweat. So, a lot of, so you need to know if you're an outlier. Um, so some people will sweat a lot of, lose a lot of water, but not a lot of electrolytes. Some people will lose a little bit of water, but maybe a lot of electrolytes. It's very concentrated sweat, or there's variations of those. So you know, the one athlete that she was really, really good in Kona, and kind of was, when she was coaching, like, no, don't worry about, don't worry about the hydration too much. Just drink off the tables. You'll be fine. Yeah, when when they tested her, it turns out losing an extraordinarily large amount of water, but almost no electrolytes in her water. So she's just a giant cooling machine. And she just pounds whatever. Just pound as much water as you can because she doesn't lose electrolytes and she cools down and she's fine. That's her strategy for Kona. Okay, but that's an outlier. It's not going to work for me. I, I lose five times the normal amount of sodium in my sweat. I have to have a very, very... I have to, I have to preload with sodium before a heart race the day before or two days before and take the equivalent of five noon tablets per bottle. Um, so, so, so anyway, they've figured out this real easy... Um, method you can it's you basically it's portable you take it in a briefcase the sweat test takes about 20 minutes you can genetic you can figure out your genetic sweat um sweat loss and sweat race and it's really really good for people that suffer from cramps or or, or were really battle in hot races um so that's i'm really excited we're gonna have an event in december where we do sweat testing and andy and his team will be out here and then andy himself will do a talk afterwards and i know he spoke at scotty de Filippis's camp and then I'll have that as a facility. You'll be able to have sweat testing done here. Oh, cool. So it's going to be here on Laguna Beach? Yeah, it'll be the only one between south of Santa Rosa. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. I think, that, I think that's a, a mm-hmm. great place to end. People who are local, can, um, where can they find out about that event on Precision Hydration? We're just securing a venue, and then it'll be up okay. on the website or social media Pretty, all right, cool. So you guys follow Lawrence. Um, we'll put all the links in the show notes. And anything you want to leave um, leave our listeners with? Any words of final wisdom? Uh, open your heart. <laughs> <laughs> and run like Tio. <laughs> yeah, when in doubt, let it go. <laughs> and, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Is it, we, we kind of talked about like this tight breathing early on before. People working on their breathing can have really, really tight intercostal muscles and tight diaphragm. So although they're working on their breathing, they, afterwards they don't let it go. So you end up with this guy, and I have, I'm working on my breathing, and I have powerful breathing and strength breathing. It's about letting it go. 
So the way to do that is to breathe out and you can often breathe out and hold your breath a little bit at the bottom and then not too long because when you run out of breath, your body's instinct is to spasm your diaphragm and spasm your intercostals. It's the last thing we want. And so that's kind of where I think these guys are aggressively chasing breathing or ending up with spasmed intercostals and diaphragms, which is kind of the opposite of what they want because they're holding their breath for such extended period of times and you, you, you're getting that spasmy urge to breathe. So my advice to you is when in doubt, breathe out. I love it. I love it. And I just want to say that, you know, I the whole process of, you know, what happened to you and, and how you kind of just slowed down and relaxed and paid attention and you got all this information about how the body works and and using the intellect to kind of connect, okay, how is that working or whatever. Like you had said about oh, when we get calm, we, we've got access to this information and every single person who's listening to this, like you have everything you need right now inside of you, everything. Yeah, amen to that. And Thank when you're you. calm, it comes to you. Yes, yes. My, teach, my meditation teacher said um, a couple weeks ago, when we're calm, we're invincible. I love that. Thank you so much. This has been oh, such thank a... thank you. This was amazing. Such a pleasure.